This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. Results in the presidential race are still coming in, and legal challenges are expected, but we wanted to take a step back today. No matter who wins the White House, will the breakdown of who Americans supported in this election give us an idea of the direction our country will take? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. My guests for the hour on Zoom today, Amanda Taub, news columnist for the New York Times Interpreter. You may get the newsletter in your inbox. The Interpreter explores the ideas and context behind major world events. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Also here with us, Dr. Bilal Siku, Associate Professor of Politics and Government at the University of Hartford. Hi, Bilal. Good morning. So I wanted to start with Bilal because uh, we know that many of us keep refreshing our <laughs> our uh, our Chrome or uh, to look at the results coming in when we are looking at the Electoral College map. And I wanted to ask, you know, when we have such a polarizing figure in the White House like Donald Trump, what comes to your mind when you see so many Americans have supported him again? I believe uh, the latest number is Trump has won at least four million more votes than he did in 2016. Absolutely. Um, for me personally, you know, what's really bizarre about this moment that we're in as a, a country is that we have a president who is on record and people who follow this and track this, he lies constantly about small things and things of real consequence. Um, he's got a, a long track record. In fact, if you were looking at his resume, his resume would you know, show numerous uh, moments when uh, he should have done the exact opposite, that he displayed and did things that, you know, were sounded racist, sexist, xenophobic, and other sort of hate-filled kinds of language. He's called for the jailing of many of his opponents. He's used the office of the presidency for personal profit and gain. And most recently, he's mismanaged a pandemic that has cost lives. And yet, nearly half of the American population that voted during this election set all of that aside and voted for him, um, it, which is just really astonishing when you think about it. Mm. Uh, when we look again at the popular vote and people are comparing it to Electoral College uh, count, this is another nail biter of an election. Why do we have another election that looks like this below? Uh, you know, absolutely. You know, definitely. When you you look at this again, quite astonishing. Um, the president is like is you know everything's lining up for him to lose the popular vote. He has the potential to win the um, electoral college vote, depending on what happens in the five remaining states. And I think you know when you look at this, I think one of the, in my mind at least, the sort of eight hundred pound gorilla in the room is the issue of race. And I think part of what has allowed the president to have the success that he has had, you know, over these last four years is just how deep that divide is. America's original sin, of course, was slavery and genocide against indigenous people. But this issue of chattel slavery and the way in which we as a society has not, have not been able to reconcile um, our differences around those lines has really meant that, you know, a president could do the kind of things this president has done, you know, whether it's dog whistles that he's really, you know, more like a, 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 a foghorn of, of, you know, racist sort of innuendo. Um, and he's been allowed to, to do that over these last four years because I think many people in his base, that resonates with them. And I think the issue of race and the problem of racism in our society runs very deep. And this president shows us just that just how much after eight years of having an African-American in office, it really did not mean that we were a post-racial society and that race and racism and the problem of white supremacy is real in our country. Mm. Amanda Tell, but you've written a lot about what Bilal uh, has uh, just mentioned. Let's start with uh, race. When we look at the systems in place in our country, our two-party system, uh, you spoke with a political science professor uh, in, in Maryland about the, the social hierarchy and uh, the dispute in America that comes down to race and how the two parties look at it very differently. Yeah, so um, 
I was speaking to Liliana Mason, who is a professor of political science at the University of Maryland, and she made the point that I thought was very smart that right now the big political divide in America is over whether the social hierarchy should change or whether it should stay the same. Um, and the Republican Party has very much taken the um, position that hierarchies should not change. And I should point out that that's not just race. Race mm -hmm. is, um, you know, one of the foundational structures of the American social hierarchy, but there's also gender, there's money and class, um, and these things all link together. Um, but I think that it is a huge, huge question in American politics right now, and it's something that you can see reflected in so many of the different political disputes that are happening. So sometimes it's very clear, as with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, they are very clear about the way that the current racial hierarchy is putting Black Americans in danger and the ways that they want that to change. But sometimes it's about things that are kind of, you know, they, it seems odd that they would be major political disputes at all. So, um, you know, my colleagues at the New York Times wrote the 1619 Project. It was an, an issue of the New York Times Magazine, it came out over a year ago, about the importance of slavery to the United States' founding and history. That is not the sort of thing that you would expect to be a major issue of a presidential campaign more than a year later. Um, but it absolutely is. And I think that it has become a way to have this argument about the legitimacy of the racial and social hierarchy in the United States, and therefore whether it needs to change or not. Mm. It's interesting when we look back at the campaigning before Election Day, uh, the, the rhetoric coming um, from the president and even some uh, Republican candidates uh, running uh, for office in different states, this idea about uh, what will come into the suburbs if someone like uh, Joe Biden and the Democrats uh, come into power. I mean, that that's interesting as well. Amanda, what's your what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think the suburbs, even though in a lot of parts of the country, the suburbs are no longer particularly white in the sort of, you know, popular imagination and political discourse. The suburbs are the destination for white flight. So when Trump says the Democrats want to destroy the suburbs, what he's saying, um, you know, whether it's a dog whistle or a foghorn, a lot of people hear it as saying that the destinations for white flight, the place that white people can go to escape diversity and to preserve the privileges that, a, you know, a segregated society has traditionally given white people. Trump is saying that's going to go away, that the Democrats are going to destroy it. Um, and he is essentially trying to whip up racial fear um, by doing that. One thing I will say about this election that I think is quite interesting is that that does not seem to have been particularly successful in the suburbs themselves. Um, you know, we've, we've seen that the Republican Party has not done as well in the suburbs of big cities um, as they, you know, were once on a trajectory to do. Um, so I, I think that this is, it's not a simple story. Mm. Um, and it's one that we're still waiting for, you know, not just the vote count, but the specifics of the demographics of, you know, who voted how and where. Um, but I think that it's really important to make the point that saying that race is an important issue here is not the same thing as saying that, you know, white people are on one side and black people are on another or anything like that. Um, it seems like it's becoming pretty clear that the you know, even if even if race is an issue that people are voting on, that doesn't mean that their race is determining their vote in the same way that might once have been true. That's Amanda Taub, news columnist for The New York Times Interpreter, as we talk more about uh, what we're seeing and hearing uh, after Election Day. Also with us, Dr. Bilal Siku, Associate Professor of Politics and Government at the University of Hartford. Bilal, did you want to respond to, uh, to Amanda's points? Yeah. I mean, Amanda raises some a, a lot of really interesting issues. I think on the, the sort of latter point about the way in which race is um, sort of the lens in which people use to actually vote. I guess the caveat that I would add, though, is that so many of the issues that we think about as important national issues have a racial angle to them. 
that often I think affects the way in which people respond to those issues. And so while it may not be front and center always for people, it, it lingers there in the in the background. And I think that's something that we should really um, you know, pay attention to. I think in general, I, the other thing that's been amazing to me is the way in which uh, Donald Trump has transformed the Republican Party. Um, and it's not the, the party of, say, Eisenhower or the party of Nixon or even the party of Ronald Reagan. It, it is a party that has been really shaped over the last four years into one in which uh, you know, politics of fear and grievances and white nationalism has come front and center with the way in which the party approaches a lot of issues, talks about many of the challenges that we face as a nation, whether it's sort of trying to you know, stir up racial resentment about people of color moving into communities, um, white communities in the suburbs and using sort of fear as the tactic to sort of whip up political support. And, and again, I think what's astonishing to me is just the fact that people are able to set that aside and still vote for a figure who comes to sort of represent um, those kinds of things that we as a nation talk about um, that we're not as a nation, right? And so there are these sort of myths about America being an inclusive society, a place where immigrants could come here and, and blend in and become a part of the uh, American fabric. But the reality is, is that, you know, this is a country that for many Americans is a country that is defined not by its inclusiveness, but by the willingness of people to come here and to, uh, I guess, embrace whiteness as the sort of norm of behavior and the norm of what is expected of people in this society. And I think that's being challenged by these demographic ch changes that are occurring in the country. And it's really scaring a lot of Americans and it's fueling this politics of fear and grievance. And Donald Trump has, you know, quite spectacularly been able to uh, capitalize on that and it has propelled, it propelled him into the White House and it may in fact keep him in the White House depending on how this uh, count goes over mm -hmm. the next day or so. Amanda Bilal talks about norms. When you look at institutions in our country, including political parties, uh, we have a candidate, a president now saying that uh, he wants uh, the voting to stop and that uh, this election is a fraud. Uh, that's an example of undermining a system. But who in the Republican Party is speaking out about that? Uh, I think there are two things that I find, you know, both interesting and worrying about um, what has happened there. Um, it wasn't surprising that President Trump made that statement. He had telegraphed it ahead of time as about as clearly as it's possible to do, made mm -hmm. multiple public and private statements saying he was going to do that. I would say in a quote unquote normal version of our political system, you would expect the Republican Party to prevent its candidates or its politicians from making that kind of statement. Because even if an individual candidate might have some short term gain from questioning the validity of an electoral process, you would expect parties to be more invested in the kind of validity of the system, in trust in the system itself. But it's been clear from the very beginning that the Republican Party does not have enough control over Donald Trump to prevent him from saying or doing just about anything. Um, you know, that's been obvious since the first primary he ran um, back in, you know, the last time around. Um, but it does seem interesting to me that when President Trump came out and made that statement, a number of people, um, both current and former officials of the Republican Party, pretty immediately said, no, we're going to count every vote. Um, I think the the strongest wording came from former officials, as is often the case. So his mm -hmm. former national security advisor, John Bolton, and former Governor Chris Christie both said, you know, this is outrageous and he is attacking the system and undermining trust in it. Um, but Senator Marco Rubio said, we'll know the result when every legally cast ballot has been counted. Rhonda McDaniel, the chairwoman of the Republican Party, said the same thing. Um, and so their statements, I think, were... Uh, both clearly a repudiation of what the president had said in the immediate term, um, you know, when he went on TV on early Wednesday morning mm -hmm. and said that the couch should stop. But 
their language about every legally cast ballot does still leave open the possibility that they will challenge the legality of ballots, try to claim that they are fraudulent, um, which has been part of the Republican political strategy in the past, even though there's very little evidence that um, ballots are fraudulently cast in the United States. Hmm. Bilal, uh, before we head to break, I just wanted to bring up what happened uh, just the other day uh, in Detroit. Uh, we know that Detroit has the largest black population by any percentage of a major U.S. city, and election challengers were uh, shouting stop the count at poll workers in Detroit uh, yesterday. It was a really unsettling scene. What was your reaction when you saw that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I was really shocked. And it, it, it hasn't happened only in Detroit. And, yeah. and as you know, Detroit is my hometown. So I've got a sort of a, a warm sort of a spot in my heart about the city and, and what the city has gone through and just how important this vote is. I mean, in some ways, you know, the drop off in turnout in 2016 in Detroit is part of the explanation for why Donald Trump was able to to win Michigan the last time. And at least my understanding now is that there's been record turnout from the city of Detroit in terms of the percentage of the vote. And so people have exercised their democratic right and to have, you know, basically a mob at the door chanting, um, stop the count is just not the way our democracy should work. The, you know, the thing that worries me, you know, about all of this is the, the long-term harm to our political system that, you know, all of these calls for stopping the count and undermining the legitimacy of the election will have. You know, certainly, you know, political elites who are saying that, you know, count every vote um, and, you know, whether that, you know, works with the base of supporters or at least the sort of core hardcore base of supporters with Donald Trump is up in the air. I mean, one of the things I think Republicans have learned over the years is that, you know, the people who are hardcore supporters of the president, you know, take their cues not from the political leaders of the party, but they take their cues from the president. And so as a result of that, I think the long term potential harm of all of this is that people will continue to question the legitimacy of institutions, the legitimacy of elections, um, the belief uh, in the importance of political participation becomes eroded by all of this. And so, um you know, we we will it'll be determined what the long term harm is. But I just have I have a feeling that even having important voices in the party hierarchy may not have the effect of sort of quieting those concerns that many hardcore supporters of the president have about absentee ballots and the legitimacy of the sort of process of mail in voting and the legitimacy of the count of the vote. I mean, all of those things are harmful to democratic institutions and democratic practices. We're going to be talking more about the state of our democracy and where we go from here uh, with my guest, Dr. Bilal Siku, Associate Professor of Politics and Government at the University of Hartford, and Amanda Taub, who's written a lot about this, news columnist for the New York Times Interpreter column. You can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. How do you feel about the systems in place that protect our democracy? We're talking about that with my guest today on Zoom, Amanda Taub, news columnist for the New York Times Interpreter column and newsletter, which explores the ideas and context behind major world events. And Balasi Ku is here, University of Hartford Associate Professor of Political Science. Amanda, before this election, we see how polarized our country has become. And uh, now that we're waiting for the results, we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know, we can't see into the future. But looking at some of uh, what has happened in the past, can you provide some context about the polarization and the state of our democracy today? Absolutely. I mean, I think that the United States has become so polarized that we probably need to find a new word for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it. it I think that the thing that captures it best for me is thinking about it as more like a sports rivalry in the sense that, you know, when we feel strongly about a sports team, it is a powerful emotional connection. Um, you know, sports games can provoke violence. They can, um, you know, people sing, they dance, they spend vast amounts of money. They will just, you know, they'll change aspects of their lives um, that uh, bear 
relatively little resemblance to how important the matter is in terms of other aspects of their lives. And so when you translate that onto politics, then it has some really powerful skewing um, skewing effects because politics, of course, does have a huge implication for people's lives. It is literally a matter of life and death, as Bilal said a few minutes ago, um, on matters like the response to the pandemic, police violence, other major factors facing the United States right now. But when people's emotional attachment to their candidate is of the kind of sports team variety and their opposition to the other side is of the sports team variety, then it's very difficult for that to be responsive to the actual issues that are facing the United States. And so I think that one of the things that we're seeing right now is just kind of a confusing response to things like the country being in the grips of a catastrophic pandemic that has killed thousands and thousands of people. Um, I think in a situation where American politics was not so polarized, where people were not, you know, making decisions in such an emotional way, um, about their attachment to one side and their opposition to another, then things might be a little bit different. But that's not the country we live in right now. Um, I think that opposing the other side has become as powerful a motivation for many people as supporting their own, um, sometimes even more so. I've been thinking a lot about um, Donald Trump Jr. saying that uh, you know his, his father has, I can't even remember what it was. It was something along the lines of he's going to continue to make the country great and continue to make liberals cry. Um, and the fact that those two things were kind of placed in equal hierarchy next to each other, I think just says a lot about our political system and how difficult it is to make substantive progress um, and get past some of those emotional, emotional hangups. When we look at our political system, Amanda, the two party system, that's part of the problem that leads to the polarization, making us more vulnerable to uh, some of this, the extremists, the uh, positions that have come out and the groups. I'm thinking of uh, QAnon being one of them. I think that's absolutely true. I think that because we have a two party system and a winner take all system, mm -hmm. um, you can end up getting the two parties driven towards the extremes. And so far in the United States, we've seen that happen much more on the Republican side than the Democratic side. It hasn't been a kind of an equal retreat towards the margins. Um, and one reason for that is you can see how a small group of very motivated extreme voters can capture control of a party, which is essentially what happened with Trump in the 2016 primary. So uh, Donald Trump never won a majority of primary mm -hmm. votes in any of the competitive primary elections, but there were so many candidates that he ended up with the kind of largest minority vote and so was able to win enough of the competitive primaries to then be, you know, basically carry carried over the finish line by extreme partisan sentiment in the general election. But if you think about that, that is a, you know, the primary voters are already a small minority of general election voters, and he was winning a small minority of the primary voters. That's a very small percentage of overall Republican voters to be able to capture control of the party in that way. But as Bilal said, in the intervening years, there's been an absolute Trumpification of the Republican Party. Loyalty to him has become an important value for the party. And as an institution, it has lost a lot of the authority it might once have had to impose discipline on their candidates and their politicians. Um, and so it has injected a lot of extremism into the political system that would not have otherwise been there. Mm -hmm. um, Bilal, I wanted to get your comments on to what Amanda says before I, I talk further about maybe what other countries, how they operate and what we can learn. But what are your thoughts, Bilal? I mean, you know, once again, Amanda has, has really sort of laid out there some really interesting um, comments ab about a range of, of things. I guess, you know, particularly what I'm sort of struck by, at least in, in this moment that we're, we're in, is just as your, your question was posed to us, just how deep the sort of polarization is within our within our country right now. Now, of course, if you do the the sort of long view of American history, we've had other periods in which there has been extreme polarization. So that's actually not anything new. 
We've also had, you know, periods in which we saw, you know, fringe groups, fringe personalities sort of ascend and, and have a, you know, sort of voice in American politics that was quite large and the demagoguery of, of those figures, you know, really made an impression on a lot of Americans. You know, you can look at the 1930s in the midst of the Great Depression and the, the figures who sort of rose to prominence during that period. You can look at the 1950s and McCarthyism. And so this is, this is not new in, a, in American sort of public life uh, in that particular sense. And so, you know, uh, you know, back in the 1950s, a very famous article was written about the paranoid style in American politics. And so to see uh, organizations, you know, groups like QAnon sort of rise to prominence and to have people embrace, you know, these wild ideas about, uh, you know, Democrats who are kidnapping children and selling them and, you know, sexual slavery and, and you know, to, to the point where someone goes into a pizza place with a with a gun, um, this is just not new. And in, in many ways, this has just been a part of American society um, and American politics. But I think the thing that really sort of strikes me about what's quite unique about this moment, and, and Amanda could probably speak more to this point, is just the role of the media in all of this. Um, you know, and again, I'm thinking, you know, Fox News and what you sort of hear on Fox News versus other mainstream news. Um, the way in which the ecosystem of the internet and social media and, and how all of this is sort of impacting our political system. And in that sense, that's really unprecedented. It's something we didn't have in the past because those technologies didn't exist. And I think they are going to continue to push us further apart. And, you know, if Joe Biden win this, wins this election, he's gonna have a really tough time trying to bring us back together. Amanda, did you wanna to respond to Bilal? Yeah, I think that he raises a really important point about the media. I think that um, we're at a moment where the media is essentially no longer capable of serving the function in American democracy that we expect it to. That's not universally true, and I think it is more true on the right than on the left. But you know, because of the th of things like the decline of local newspapers, um, the you know fundamental information providing function that um, the media used to provide in America is not present everywhere. Um, despite the excellent efforts of local NPR affiliates, there's only so much you guys can do. Um, you know, this is supposed to be an ecosystem. It's not supposed to be a monoculture. And I think that what has ended up taking its place um, is a lot of social media. And we know um, from a lot of research as well as reporting that I've done, my colleagues have done, that the the stories that thrive on social media tend to be more emotion driven, often conspiracy theories do extremely well there. And now we have an ecosystem on the political right in the United States where the connections between right wing social media, right wing alternative media like podcasters and bloggers um, and right wing, more mainstream professional media sites, which include Fox News, as well as sites like Breitbart, they have very close connections with each other, which means it's very easy for a conspiracy theory or a rumor or wild disinformation to quickly make the jump from a fringe social media account to Fox News being broadcast all over the country or to the, you know, White House uh, press secretaries, Twitter, or something like that, or the president himself. And that is something that is unprecedented. And we don't have any kind of media immune system that protects us from it. Um, the social media platforms are trying to do things this election with, you know, adding warnings to tweets that might be misinformation or removing things from the viral algorithms. But those are very piecemeal. Um, they're trying to kind of implement and figure them out in real time. And it's very difficult for them to keep up with the algorithms on their own sites. And, you know, organizations like the New York Times, where I work, have been doing really excellent reporting, debunking conspiracy theories. But, you know, those are putting band-aids on, on bullet wounds. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a more fundamental problem than we can solve with these sort of piecemeal uh, individual fixes. You hear Amanda. Oh, go ahead, Bilal. 
if I can say, uh, you know, and what's amazing is that a lot of this information now is, is getting out there and shaping the narrative around this, this election at this moment. Um, you know, right now people are circulating, you know, articles about how, for example, 100,000, you know, sort of ballots were dumped into Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of the things that the president has been sort of say, saying about election fraud, there are stories, you know, how much of this will be coming from outside of the country, from places like Russia, for example, is yet to be determined. But I think, you know, this is a real challenge. And, and as Amanda has said, there's no sort of immune system here. And the lack of trust in the media, as um, and it, which has really historically been a very important sort of institution for checking, you know, government and putting a check on the power of elected officials, and for that matter, corporations and others, all of that ha has eroded. And we pretty much exist in our own little sort of bubble of, of news and, and information. And for far too many Americans, the news and information they're getting is a distortion of reality. And, and that is now being reflected into our political system. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I just, I worry that that could actually be the most dangerous legacy ultimately of this election. Um, not because I don't think that who gets elected actually matters. I do very much think that that matters, but because once trust is eroded and once doubt has been constructed, once people don't know who they can trust and what they can believe, it's incredibly difficult to build that back up again. And until you have public trust, it's very difficult to make a democratic system work. Um, and so I just really worry that we might be doing more damage right now than we realize that I'm not sure what's going to be able to fix it. You can join our conversation with Amanda Taub, news columnist for the New York Times Interpreter, and Dr. Bilal Siku, Associate Professor of Politics and Government at the University of Hartford, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Callie is calling in from Bridgeport. Callie, go ahead. Hi, yes, thanks for having me. Um, I was calling to just comment on the conversation around our nation being like deeply divided and polarized. Um, I actually think that we are not um, and that those divisions are being manufactured or, you know, sowed, you know, as as your um, guests have been articulating through various means, the media, uh, you know, fear mongering, all that. But Biden just received the most votes of any presidential candidate in the history of our country. And um, voting is a collective power, right? We look at voting as the, um, in democracy, as the uh, assertion of collective will. And um, in this country, we, we often like to think of that, about it as individual choice. But, you know, I think that <clears throat> what um, one of your guests was saying earlier about whiteness and, and is really like what is going on here. So white power structures have been, you know, secure and in place. And the promise of Obama's presidency was that we were really going to make democracy real and bring way, way more people into it. And Trump is, you know, what is happening is a direct, he was a direct response to that. And so I'm not so sure that we're deeply divided as we are trying collectively to really make the promise of our democracy real. And um, and the blame for sowing those divisions has to be articulated really clearly. It, you know, we I think we need to we don't we shouldn't be blaming individual Americans. We should be pointing um, very clearly at who is sowing those divisions and why. So thank you. Thank you, Kelly, uh, for your very thoughtful comments. Bilal, did you want to respond to our, our, our listener? Yeah, absolutely. You know, great comments um, by her on on these questions. And I think, you know, you know, certainly there are lots of things that Americans do, in fact, agree upon. And many of those things are overshadowed by those things that we disagree about. But part of the challenge is that some of the things we disagree about are really you know, important wedge issues. And, and, and unfortunately, we have political leaders who want to exploit those differences in order to sort of amass political power. 
I mean, what I'm really struck by when I when I think about the National Republican Party is that, you know, for example, they talked once the Affordable Care Act was passed, they talked about how they wanted to get rid of it and that they would offer some sort of a alternative, right? And then we watched through the Obama years, no alternative be offered. We've watched over these last four years, no alternative be offered. And yet the rhetoric about destroying the Affordable Care Act and how unfair it is to the American people, how costly, et cetera, et cetera, continues to be something that they talk about and have gone to court about in you know, numerous court cases. And so what has amazed me then about the, the National Republican Party is that it has ceased to be a really, it has ceased to be a governance party. It's really a party that seeks power. And the American people have real serious problems that we need to face and confront as a nation. And at least one of our political parties is failing to provide answers to those kinds of questions. And rather what they're doing is they're sort of, you know, stroking the grievances and the resentment and the sense of being left behind that are legitimate concerns, legitimate problems that many Americans are facing with what's happened with global capitalism and, and, and other challenges we face as a country. And yet they really don't offer much in the area of solutions, but they really do play to what Amanda talked about earlier, the emotions that people have about what they are experiencing and not providing real solutions to those problems. Amanda, I wanted to just go back to something Callie uh, had brought up about um, Joe Biden's, uh, the number of Americans that have voted uh, for him, uh, the popular uh, vote count. And when we think about some of the flaws in our democratic system, uh, people who uh, point to our electoral college that grants a disproportionate amount of power to voters in rural areas and swing states. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the electoral college is becoming more and more obviously a distortion on our political system um, with, you know, every presidential election that passes. Um, and so is the Senate, which is distorting in a very similar way. Um, you know, the, it's telling right now, for instance, that we are kind of all watching with bated breath as a few counties in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada count their votes, even though Joe Biden is currently ahead in the popular vote by a very substantial margin. Um, and so, you know, that that has a distorting effect on any number of things. You know, it's not just that it distorts the geographical impact of different people's votes, which it does, but it also distorts whether people feel like voting is worthwhile at all. Um, you know, whether people feel like there is any purpose in casting a ballot if you live in a, you know, very safely Republican or very safely Democratic area, um, you know, that is a distortion and it's one that has a pretty significant effect for down ballot races for local office and for state office. Um, and, you know, I think that it's also worth remembering that for all that Joe Biden has gotten an unprecedented number of votes in this election, a huge, huge proportion of eligible American adults do not vote. Um, and we have traditionally treated this as a matter of kind of individual apathy. Why don't people care? Um, and I think that it makes a lot more sense to look at it as a structural issue. You know, we have we have given people reasons not to care and we have given people reason to believe that there it will be more trouble than it's worth to vote. And we have given people reason to believe that voting is a difficult or frightening or in a pandemic, even dangerous thing to do. Um, and that is also part of our dem democracy. And that is also something that has a distorting effect like the Electoral College. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. You just heard Amanda Taub, news columnist for the New York Times interpreter. Dr. Balasi Koo is also here, associate professor of politics and government at the University of Hartford. We'll continue talking with them right after a short break.
You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Amanda Taub is here, news columnist for the New York Times, interpreter, newsletter and column, and Dr. Bilal Siku, University of Hartford Associate Professor of Political Science. Uh, Rebecca's calling in from Rocky Hill. Rebecca, go ahead. Hi. I have to say that I'm not happy that we're so deeply divided as a state, as a country, but I am happy that the spotlight on the individual numbers, as this is a painful, drawn-out process, that spotlight tells me how deeply divided we are, and I didn't know that before. And it gives me a much better perspective on what my neighbors might be experiencing and maybe, just maybe, a chance to build some bridges where I didn't know there was a divide. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for calling in. Amanda, before we run out of time, we did want to talk to you because we know you've done uh, you know, a lot of research and reporting on how uh, other systems work in other countries when we look at uh, our democracy and some of the flaws. Could you give us some examples? Um, sure. I mean, one that has been on my mind a lot this week is Australia, where voting is legally required, um, and they tend to have well over 90% voter turnout. Um, and I think that, you know, it it gives people an additional sense of trust and investment in the system, and it also gives um, politicians a reason to, uh, you know, to reach out directly for votes rather than trying to limit who shows up to cast them. Um, So that I think is something that I've been thinking about a lot. I also have been thinking a lot about the presidential system that we have in the United States. So um, younger democracies, countries that have rewritten their constitutions more recently tend to avoid having a presidency because it is a system that is particularly vulnerable to populism and Mm. to authoritarian kind of breakdown. Um, And I think that the United States has thus far managed to weather those problems relatively well, um, but it's a vulnerability that we have in our system. um, And that, you know, I think is something that we're probably going to see more and more attention on um, going forward. And then I think the other thing, of course, are the Senate and Electoral College. You know, those likewise are not something that you would put into a democracy if you were building one from the ground up today. Um, And I think if you look at, for instance, parliamentary systems, they tend to be more flexible, um, particularly if they have proportional representation rather than um, winner-take-all voting by district. They're much more capable of having multiple parties represent um, a more nuanced picture of the electorate. When we think back to how there have been authoritarian breakdowns in uh, what used to be strong democracy, that's happened in, in South America. Can you give us a little bit of context there? So, yeah, so the the biggest example of this um, that people tend to point to is Venezuela, um, which was a you know, one of the oldest democracies in the world um, and ended up experiencing a populist breakdown um, with the rise of Hugo Chavez. And certainly, you know, Mr. Chavez and and his um, supporters and his colleagues within the government deserve a lot of the blame for that. But it's worth pointing out that democracy in Venezuela was really already in crisis before Chavez came to power. Mm. Um, You know, there was already a tremendous loss of trust. There was already tremendous anger at corruption and a sense that the system was unable to kind of serve the public interest. Um, And there was already a lot of polarization there um, as well between different groups. And so I think that's not to say that the United States will necessarily follow in Venezuela's footsteps, but it is to say that these structural factors matter and the structural dangers um, can be very dangerous, even if a country has been democratic for a long time. But the other thing that I would point out, which I think is easy to leave out of the conversation, is that the United States has only been a full democracy in the way we tend to envision since the 1970s, because before that, in the Jim Crow South, there was, in effect, a one-party semi-authoritarian state. Um, you know, they they voted in federal elections, but in local elections, it was not just one-party rule, but it was one-party rule that violently excluded Black Americans from voting and from political participation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you look at it from that perspective, the United States is not actually that long-standing a democracy in terms of the entire country.
Before we run out of time, a listener wanted to hear more from both of you about, you know, we are a free democratic society, but how do we work against disinformation? Uh, should there be penalties for, for spreading uh, this disinformation? Amanda, I'll go to you first. I think that, um, no, there should not be penalties for spreading disinformation um, because one of the big problems with it is that it tends to be something that people do relatively innocently. They think that they're spreading important information that their neighbors and friends need to know and they don't know that it's false. And in fact, the problem is that they don't know that it's false. I think if we were going to take one single step to halt or limit the spread of disinformation, it would be to turn off the algorithms that the social media companies use to decide which posts get amplified because they are more likely to amplify posts that speak directly to people's emotions um, and which may not themselves be disinformation, but certainly disinformation tends to be within that category. Mm -hmm. Bilal, before we run out of time, I just want to get your thoughts on that question. I, I think Amanda really summed it up well in terms of, you know, what could possibly be done and what shouldn't be done. And so I think it's 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 a difficult question. I don't know that we're going to be able to to fix this. The entire sort of ecosystem of social media and, and the mainstream media, for that matter, is built on the idea of, of profit. And so making money, I think, uh, and putting the public interest, if we've got to see those as the, the two sort of choices that many of these companies will make, uh, profits will prevail rather than the public interest. Before we end the show, we should mention, you know, with this record amount of, of turnout and engagement, uh, Gambalal, uh, you teach at a university. You must be excited to see uh, the number of people, especially young people, turning out and looking at the way we can make voting easier for Americans. Yeah, absolutely. And Amanda sort of laid out some of the, the structural changes that need to occur. And I, I definitely concur about the Senate and the Electoral College. I mean, the reality is that both of those were accommodations that were made to the 25 slaveholders who met, you know, with the other, uh, you know, framers of the Constitution in that summer of 1787, and we're living with the consequences of that. You know, but for, for my students, uh, you know, we've got to do as much as we can to remove any sort of barriers to their ability to be involved, uh, you know, in the political process. We've got to do a lot more work with how we talk to young people about the importance of political involvement. And so our civics curriculum at the high school and the junior high level needs to be improved. We need to find ways to really engage them to explore what their passions are and give them opportunities to get out there and to become engaged. As I always tell my students, you know, this first vote that you're doing right now will follow you through the rest of your life. If you don't vote this time, it becomes very easier the next time to not vote. But if you vote this time, it becomes a lot easier to vote the next time. This has been a really interesting hour with both of you. Thank you, Bilal Siku, University of Hartford Associate Professor of Political Science. Thanks, Bilal. Thank you for having me. And Amanda Tabb, news columnist for the New York Times Interpreter column. The newsletter is always really interesting. Amanda, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. Our today's show has been produced by Carmen Baskoff. Uh, thanks to our tech producer, Kat Pastor. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We hope you tune in again tomorrow. We're going to talk about the Affordable Care Act, a, a case before the Supreme Court uh, coming up. And we want to hear from you too. Join the conversation on the next Where We Live.